Greetings students and welcome back to another video on quantum mechanics. In this lesson we're going to solve the time-independent Schrodinger equation for the harmonic oscillator. But before I begin to solve this equation for the quantum harmonic oscillator, let's go back in time to our classical mechanics glory days and talk about ye old Hooke's law. Suppose I have a mass m attached to a massless frictionless spring with a spring constant k, which can be thought of as the stiffness of the spring. Suppose also that the mass starts off at the resting or equilibrium position, which I'll set to zero. At this position, there's no net elastic force that's pushing or pulling it from the spring. However, if I pull the mass by an arbitrary distance x as such, then the spring will exert a force negative kx, where negative means the leftward direction, to pull the mass back to the equilibrium position. It's negative kx, obviously, because the force is acting opposite to the direction the mass was displaced. The elastic force wants the mass to return to equilibrium. Now, if the net force acting on the mass is only the elastic force, then we can use Newton's second law to express the net force as mass times acceleration, which we can then equate to negative kx. If we isolate the second derivative, then we end up with negative k over mx, the solution to this second order ODE is something you can easily find, since I assume you've done a course in differential equations before. The solution consists of the sum of sines and cosines to denote the fact that the mass oscillates around the equilibrium position. The a and b are constants that depend on the initial conditions, while the omega here, which denotes the angular frequency of my oscillation, is just the square root of k over m. Now the elastic potential energy of this mass depends on how far we've displaced it from equilibrium and on how stiff the spring is. If we've displaced the mass really far, then the greater the force that the spring will use to pull it back, the more vigorously the mass will try to come back and the greater the elastic potential energy. Similarly, if we increase K and make the spring more stiff, the more vigorously the mass will try to come back to equilibrium and the greater the elastic potential energy. So with these principles in mind, the elastic potential energy is written as half kx squared. It increases with the stiffness and with the displacement of the mass from the equilibrium. This should make intuitive sense, hopefully, given my explanation just now. We can also write this elastic potential energy in terms of mass and omega as half m omega squared x squared. This is one of the motivations for using the quantum harmonic oscillator, this potential energy expression for a mass oscillating on a spring. The other motivation comes from the Taylor series expansion. If I have a generic potential function v of x which could represent anything, then if v is a continuous, differentiable, and generally nice function, I can expand v of x in a Taylor series around some point x0, which I'll make a local minimum of v of x. In my expansion, I'll have a constant term, a linear term in x, and a quadratic term in x. Now, if the amplitude of my oscillations is sufficiently small, if x doesn't appreciably deviate from x0, which is the equilibrium point here, where the potential energy is minimized, then I can just ignore the higher order terms and approximate the potential just using the quadratic term. Of course, the linear term becomes zero since x0 is a minimum, and the first derivative of v is obviously zero at the minimum. So when the amplitude of my oscillations is small enough, then I can approximate any nice generic potential as a quadratic function, which is another reason it's important to solve Schrodinger's equation for a quadratic potential, or the Schrodinger equation for the harmonic oscillator. So let's start solving the time-independent Schrodinger equation for the quantum harmonic oscillator. In this situation, my potential v of x is given by half m omega squared x squared. As a result, this is what the time-independent Schrodinger equation will look like for this harmonic potential. Now the first step in the solution process is to convert this differential equation to dimensionless form. What that will do is cut out a lot of the extra variables and make this equation easier to look at and deal with algebraically. Now if you recall my video on non-dimensionalizing differential equations, you'll know there's a specific technique you can use to perform non-dimensionalization. You've got two variables here, psi and x, in this differential equation. I can set up their dimensionless counterparts, psi tilde and x tilde, which are defined by taking the dimensional variable psi or x, subtracting an arbitrary reference value with the subscript r, and dividing by a scaling factor with the subscript s. I'm going to set the reference values to zero since there isn't really a special point we're doing things around, so I'll just make it zero for simplicity. This means our dimensionless variables are formed by dividing our original variables by scaling factors. 
If you actually introduce these dimensionless variables into the differential equation, you'll find that the scaling factor psi sub s will actually be present in every term, so it'll just cancel out. I won't prove this to you since it's not really necessary for the purposes of learning harmonic oscillators, but you can convince yourself as an exercise. Because the scaling factor psi sub s is kind of meaningless, I'm only going to non-dimensionalize my variable x. And to use the dimensionless x, I first need to compute the derivatives of psi and write them in terms of x tilde. Using the chain rule, I can write the first derivative of psi with respect to x as d psi by dx tilde times dx tilde over dx. Since the derivative of x tilde with respect to x is just 1 over x sub s, this is what we get for d psi by dx. Now the second derivative of psi with respect to x can be found by differentiating this equation again with respect to x. What I'll do now is write the dx on the right as the differential of x tilde times x sub s, which if you go back to the definition of x tilde is what x is in terms of x tilde. I can take the x sub s out of the differential on the right since x sub s is just a constant, and when I do that I end up with x sub s squared in the denominator multiplying the second derivative of psi with respect to x tilde on the right. Now if we replace our regular derivatives with these partially dimensionless derivatives in our harmonic oscillator Schrodinger equation, this is what we'll have. Note that I've also replaced the x with the x tilde times x sub s, just to make everything consistent, because now we're just dealing with x tilde. This is where I'll do a couple of algebra steps. I'll divide both sides by the coefficient of the second derivative of psi, and I'll move all the psi terms to the right and leave the second derivative on the left. When I do those steps, I'll be left with the following equation. Here's where I'll find the value of my scaling constant x sub s. To do this, I'll set the coefficient of x tilde on the right to 1. This is, of course, an arbitrary decision. You could have set the second coefficient to 1, but I've set the first coefficient to 1 because it'll make things more algebraically convenient, at least in my opinion. So if this first coefficient is 1, then x sub s is then the square root of h bar over m omega. You move all the non-x sub s terms to the right, take the fourth root of a squared number, and you'll end up with the square root, so it makes sense. Plugging this x sub s into the second coefficient now leaves us with the following for our differential equation. At this point, I'll define another constant c equal to 2e over h bar omega just to simplify my writing once again. Once I do that, I'll get the second derivative of psi with respect to x tilde equals x tilde squared minus c times psi. So after all that work, we finally set up the partially dimensionless time-independent Schrodinger equation, and let's now go ahead and solve it. Well, there's where we encounter a problem, because there isn't really a good way to solve this differential equation, so we're kind of stuck. Or are we? Well, let's examine the asymptotic case, that is, let's examine the case where we pretty much run towards the edges of space, where the dimensionless x is much, much larger than the constant c. In that case, x tilde squared is even larger than c, so relative to x tilde, the constant c is pretty much negligible at the edges of the domain. In that case, our differential equation just has x tilde squared psi on the right-hand side in this particular extreme scenario. I'm going to call this equation 1. But solving this extreme case is also not a trivial task. Luckily, though, we can pull some tricks. The trick I'll use is that I'll suppose that my solution psi takes the form of a linear combination of e to the f of x tilde and e to the negative f of x tilde, where f is some function of x tilde that I need to determine. This function could be anything, we don't know yet. If we take that derivative of psi with respect to x tilde, here's what we'll get, using the chain rule that will put the derivative of f out in front. If we now take the second derivative, we can use the product rule and the chain rule to show that the second derivative will look something like this. Now let's combine the coefficients of e to the f of x tilde and e to the negative f of x tilde to end up with this cleaner equation for the second derivative of psi. We can then easily compare the second derivative to the right-hand side of equation 1 by plugging it into the equation. We'll also plug psi into the equation as follows. Now if we look at the parts multiplying e to the f and e to the negative f on both sides, we can form these two equations involving the function f. The first equation corresponds to the e to the f, while the second equation corresponds to the e to the negative f.
we can then add these two equations to get the following equation uh, in terms of f prime. Simplifying this leaves us with f prime equals plus minus x tilde, which therefore means that the function f is given by plus or minus x tilde squared over two. Now it doesn't matter whether we use the minus or plus here since both signs are covered in our formulation of psi. So in the end, using this approach, our hypothesized solution psi to this dimensionless quantum harmonic Schrodinger equation that is approximately true at the edges of the domain is given by the sum of the exponentials of x tilde squared over two and negative x tilde squared over two. I'm gonna stop here because this video is getting a little long. In the next video, I'm gonna continue solving the time-independent Schrodinger equation for the quantum harmonic oscillators. I'd like to thank the following patrons as always, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the faculty of Khan signing out.